Hi there, and welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. My name is Patrick Francie, and I am your host, and I want to begin by saying thank you for listening. On this show, I am having conversations with seemingly ordinary individuals who have achieved some amazing and extraordinary results in both their life and business. My intention is to inspire and help you learn and grow by having my guests share their journey of how they face and overcome their challenges, but also how they celebrate their many wins. And now let's get on with this show and have a conversation with today's guest. Your life, your terms is a tagline that is a grounding statement of my guest today, Tom Karadz's journey and his business. Tom's career began in about 1998 in the software industry where he quickly excelled in sales despite feeling unfulfilled in his role. And he was inspired by a legend, Dan Kennedy's teaching and coaching, and he felt driven to have personal freedom and control over his life. This led him to real estate investing and a deep dive into marketing and sales. He teamed up with his brother, Nick, and they launched their own business from scratch, which actually defied many skeptics who called their ideas, quote unquote, stupid. Their ventures include Income for Life, an investor program, and most notably Rockstar Real Estate, a brokerage dedicated to investors. Despite business and economic challenges, they have thrived by taking full responsibility for their reality and building a values-driven business. Tom's story resonates with anyone who is seeking autonomy and entrepreneurial success. He and I had a great conversation, covered a lot of topics, and as we tend to do, went down a number of rabbit holes. Without any further delays, let's get this show started. Tom Karadza, welcome to the Everyday Millionaire Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Patrick, and great job on the last name. You nailed it. You nailed it. (laughs) Okay, a little bit of practice, and uh, so thanks for that. So, Tom, we live in these kind of and operate in these parallel, I think, a little bit parallel universe here in Toronto. I'm in the, uh, you're on the kind of central Canada. I'm on the West Coast. Uh, You play in the real estate game and education and real estate game. I just in the real estate education. And so as much as we've run parallel, we've never sat down and had a conversation. This is a first for us to really start to get to know each other and have a, a great conversation. So I'm excited about hearing more about you and your business, uh, Rockstar Real Estate, your journey to get to where you are. And I always like to start with the simple question for our listener, because your bio was literally three lines. Thanks for that, by the way. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh-huh. having said all of that, that's okay, because I lead in always with the question of when somebody walks up and says, so Tom, what do you do? What's your answer to that question? Yeah, I think the the reason that the bio I shared was so short, I just feel like I'm at a stage where I don't want to be defined about what why I've done what I've done in the past for some reason. Um I'm kind of always looking forward and I always kind of want to break break the mold a little bit, but uh yeah, I guess I'm 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 the product of two immigrant parents. One was a refugee into this country and uh born on the west side of Toronto. Went to Patrick, I did all the right things. I had high marks in high school. High school came really easy to me. I was supposed to go into engineering at the University of Toronto. And because I was on the west side of Toronto, it was too far for me to go to downtown Toronto. And uh, I decided to stay at the campus that was on the west side of Toronto. And that uh, I realized when I went there that they didn't have engineering programs. (laughs) So so I went into chemistry. And uh, when I went into chemistry, I realized I hated chemistry. So then I ended up in psychology. I met my wife in the psych classes, so that worked out. And uh, I did I did the thing of going to university, graduating. I got a job at Royal Bank of Canada in the IT department. You know, that was the late 90s. Patrick, I don't know if you remember the late 90s. It was like the IT boom. The year 2000 was going to, like, destroy all the computers, and there was, like, a, a need for people to go into information technology. And I, I dove into that world. It was a pretty good-paying job, um, but I hated my life. I hated everything about kind of driving downtown and paying for the GO train in Toronto and parking if I drove down. And I realized that, honestly, I felt like I had been lied to. Like, I felt like my journey 
that have get good marks, go to school, get good job. I honestly felt incongruent to the maximum degree possible. Like I was having nightmares at home. And with my my girlfriend who became my fiance there, she remembers me like, you know, falling asleep after watching a movie or something and waking up just like with cold sweats and nightmares. Like I thought my life was over. I couldn't believe that I had spent that many years going to school to enter a, a life that I thought was going to be so mundane and so boring. And to the thought of asking permission to go on vacation, like I just couldn't, I thought, oh my gosh, like I'm a grown adult and I have to ask somebody if it's okay for me to take two weeks vacation in the summer. And then I started extrapolating my life forward and I thought, wait a second, if one day I have kids and I want to go see them at camp or hockey or soccer or dance, am I going to have to ask permission to go? And is there a possibility that somebody could say no? Mm. Because if that possibility exists, you might as well stab me in the leg right now. Like this is the, that's the worst way to live. I just felt so trapped. Well, there's so. a, okay. So you said a lot there. There's a lot to unpack for me when I listen to that, you know, a couple of things around it is that, you know, in the few minutes that we've had to have conversation kind of <laughs> offline to now, I mean, what you're talking about engineering and chemistry and university and doing all those things, it's quite cerebral. Like it's really that kind of intellect, yet that's not how you necessarily occur. And then as you're having this conversation right now, I mean, to have those thoughts at that age to say, holy cow, like this makes no sense to me that that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want my life to look like. I mean, that's, quite profound thinking at that age, you know, because I get that, you know, you could look at it and go, gosh, I've been locked in an office sucks, but most people would grind it out. That's really where people live into this. I hate my life. I hate my job. I got to go on vacation for two weeks to escape my life long enough to rest up so I can go back and get into the grind again. You at a young age, by the sounds of it, kind of went, no, I'm not going to have any of that, which to me is quite advanced thinking. You don't run across many individuals. Now, the reason I bring that up, because it actually explains a lot for my observation of Rockstar and what you and your brother Nick have created. But before I get there, I want to go back and ask you this question. You talk about your parents being immigrants from, I think you said offline, we're Croatia? My father's Croatian and our mother is Scottish. Now, you came and it also what you said to me goes, oh, there's an entrepreneurial spirit. So you're born with that or, you know, but I always look at it and ask the question of my guests, is it nature or is it nurture? So when you think about your entrepreneurial journey, because you understand, I understand had a bit of a corporate background and then you, you got the hell out of that for whatever the story is around there. I want to hear more about but when you look at your entrepreneurial journey, was that because of your parents kind of instilled that in you? Or did you just find that that's how you kind of came out of the shoot? Yeah, that's a good question. I think my parents, like my father, as an, you know, an, an immigrant here, started his own construction company. It was a drywall com uh, company. I always joke, if you know a Croatian, you're one degree of separation away from drywall expertise. He started a drywall company. English was not strong, but kind of had the work ethic to, you know, work in the drywall industry and then start his own company. So I kind of saw maybe my father, but he struggled with that. The 90s in Canada and the Toronto area were really, that was a deep recession here. Mm -hmm. And that really basically put his business out of business. And as a real estate, uh, our family was in the real estate uh business then too. My father was flipping properties in the late eighties and the nineties. So I saw that that almost bankrupt our family, Patrick. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was devastating on the real estate investing front and then on the business front. And then our mother, you know, she was always just like a different spirit in the best possible way. Like she was the direct opposite of our father who was very direct and driven. And she was more, you know, let's go to meditation camp. As I was explaining to you before we started recording when I was 13 years old and my brother would have been like eight you know, we were going to the Central Toronto Library for meditation camp in in summer um, while all my friends were like going to, you know, wherever summer camp. So I think those two mixes of like this, this mom who thought differently and the dad who just kind of did his own thing, I guess maybe it was a little bit of nurture. Like I saw this in the family and although I wasn't piecing it together that directly is the way you are asking the question, I guess just observing these two adults, my parents, <laughs> maybe created this kind of like, maybe it was like a defiance to the, to the norms, you know, this kind of like, I don't know if defiant is the right word, 
but sometimes I feel like that re- resonates with me. Like I, I don't like doing what everyone else is doing. Like if, if I see everyone else running one way, I automatically think that's the wrong way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer the question. Yeah, sense. that's fine. I, I mean, I, I guess it's always those food for thought, you know, some, sometimes we recognize it and it shows up and you know, go, yeah, no, something it was because of that. You know, my parents, either my parents were entrepreneurial yet. I don't ever remember not wanting to be an entrepreneur. You know, I've been in, I've owned a business for over 40 years, but even prior to that, that was kind of my journey. I had one job. It lasted seven and a half years. It was in the oil industry. It was, you know, a great part of my education because back in the late 70s and 80s when I was working in that corporate world, they spent a ton of dough on education and I was a fairly big company. Now, you know, you mentioned the 90s in IT and I remember specifically when we were getting computers and doing all the things, like it was a thing, right? We were, it was a thing and everybody was worried that they were gonna lose their jobs because it was gonna take over everything. And it was an interesting time when I reflect on it, when you brought it up, I go, yeah, no, I remember the eighties very well when computers were coming on board and how cool it was and, and scary all at the same time. And those dot matrix printers and like you would, I remember working in my parents' business and doing, you know, helping with the ledger and the ledger used to be like a ledger like it was a book. Yeah. You know, and you would update it. And then the computers came in and you're right. Everyone was like, what is this? We enter the numbers into this thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was a cool time when you think about it. Right. So now when you look and you went on your entrepreneurial journey, you had a short time in the corporate world uh, working. You had a job for a while. How did that? Uh, yeah. Seven years at Oracle yeah. and two years at NetSuite right before it went public for a billion dollars on the New York Stock Exchange. I was a regional sales manager and six months before it went public, I quit. Mm. And everyone thought, told me that was the wrong move, that why are you quitting before this company goes public? You have stock options and you got to do this, you know, you should stay. And uh, actually a year before it went public, I gave the VP that I reported to six months notice. Mm. So I said sometime in the next six months, because I don't want to burn bridges and I know you're going to, going to an IPO and our sales, my sales team at that time was just a great group of guys and, uh, and, and women, uh, guys and, and girls and, uh, I didn't want to screw them. So I said, I'll give you six months notice. I'm going to quit at some point in the next six months. And I'll give you two weeks notice at some point in this window. That'll give you enough time to start looking to replace me. And uh, so, yeah, I was in the corporate world for, for uh, nine years total, seven at Oracle, two at NetSuite. And, uh, and I quit to start Rockstar with a, a mortgage on my house, a four-year-old son and a 10-month-old daughter and my wife at home. So, uh, well, it's so interesting, you know, tell me a little bit about that because you had mentioned earlier that, you know, real estate, given what your dad was doing at the time, almost puts your family under in terms of going broke. And now all of a sudden you quit your job and go into real estate. And so how did that unfold? Because that must have been somewhat of a scary time. Yeah. So I think, you know, when I had that realization that the corporate world wasn't going to be for me, probably like you, I went down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes. Like I started doing stock option trading for a couple of years, couldn't really get ahead with that. I started building some websites because I had some tech background uh, going into Oracle. I, I knew how to like create my own websites and stuff. So I started creating websites to sell different eBooks. Um, I thought I would live on the beach and I'd sell like a thousand copies of an ebook and just live happily ever after. And uh, I started another, like some type of sales consultancy service. I forget all the details of it. And I remember feeling frustrated in two ways. The first was I didn't understand how to get attention and how to get pay- people to pay attention what I was uh, in what I was trying to sell, whether, whether it would be a product or a service. And I couldn't decide what I really wanted to commit to. Like I I had real estate knowledge. By that point in my 20s, I already owned rental properties. My brother and I started buying student rentals by McMaster University in Hamilton. So like outside of Toronto in our 20s. Good move. Uh, Yeah, it, it worked out. And that was part of the frustration, Patrick, because I was going to my corporate job and I looked at the cash flow I was earning from my student rental properties thinking, what am I doing? The cash flow from these student rentals isn't matching my corporate job, but it's doing pretty well. And these things are appreciating. I don't understand why I'm driving in traffic with everybody in one direction while literally the highway going towards my student rental properties was wide open. You know, when you have that kind of just that physical representation of your own frustration, I'm like, what am I doing? So then, uh, then I started studying, um, direct response marketing. And we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording is that 
I thought if I quit my job, I don't think entrepreneurs are risk takers. Like I think entrepreneurs are actually risk averse. And I, and, and for me to quit my job, I'm like, how do I mitigate all risks? And for that, I thought if I understand how to get a customer to ring my phone or walk into a business that I begin, I will feel confident that I can then serve them and make a profit. So the, the variable I need to understand here isn't how to serve them because I feel like whatever I go into, I'm going to serve them. I'm going to do the right thing. But how do I get them to come into my place of business or phone me or text me or email me? And that started a multi-year journey down the marketing front. And that's when I discovered direct response style marketing. And it was after learning that and studying that for probably three years that I went to my brother and I said, listen, I'm going to quit my job now. I feel like I understand how to get a customer. Um, so that risk is somewhat mitigated. And do you want to start this business with me or not? And you have to tell me like by tomorrow <laughs> because I'm giving notice. <laughs> and only I want brothers to know can do, only brothers can do that shit. <laughs> but to his credit, he's like, yeah, I'm in. So, uh, so, so that's kind of like, you know, a little bit of what what we went through and kind of the decision making but the, for real estate it real estate wasn't our first choice for a business although we knew real estate was amazing you could generate income from it if you managed it properly hopefully there was actually cash flow positive cash flow from it uh, they tend to appreciate over lengths of time but real estate wasn't a passion that i thought i needed to start a business around it was the lack of decision-making on what business to start that led me to real estate. I could see no other viable business for myself. So I thought, okay, I have real estate knowledge. Our family's been in it. I already own rental properties. I see that most realtors in the early 2000s were not serving real estate investors. So I thought there's a gap in the market. These transactions are happening without me. Why don't I enter the market and try to offer education based on our experiences, see if I can earn some business with the direct response and mo marketing knowledge. I think I can get some attention in that space. Mm -hmm. Why don't we kind of enter that and real estate, I'll put my stake in the ground and I will commit to real estate being the business that we go into, even though I wasn't so passionate about being a realtor and starting a brokerage. So did you pretty much with Rockstar Real Estate, did you come out of the gate with the education base behind it? Like, was that always part of the model or did you start out selling doors and I'm going to sell investment real estate or I'm just going to sell real estate? And then the education part of it morphed into it when you saw the gap or the need for your investors to learn more about it? You know, like, how did your model evolve into what it was or did it pretty much start that way, saying I'm going to educate our investors slash buyers and build a business around that education and supporting investors in, in growing their wealth, but educate them to do that, but also help them find deals. Yeah. So once I discovered that most of my competition was like in a sales funnel, you're going to have people who are looking to do business in whatever category of business you are in at different stages in, you know, in their journey. So some people are going to be just looking for information. Some people are going to graduate past that and want to talk to somebody, but they're not quite ready to do business, especially if it's a higher tick item, uh, ticket item. And then there's going to be other people who are like, they've spent the last 18 months doing all this research and they're just ready to buy. And so I discovered that in real estate, all the competition was at the last stage. All the realtors were just advertising at the last stage. Like, if you're going to buy a piece of property, I'm your guy, I'm your girl, call me. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to compete at a different stage. I will lead with education when people are at the education phase of their sales process. So it's not like the, a client or a prospect is thinking I'm now in the sales process, but the natural stages are they start doing some research and that's the information stage to me. And so I thought, oh, I will just present good information earlier on in the sales cycle and I'll try to present good information and be very valuable to people. So much so that they conclude when they're ready to buy, they will trust me because of all the good information I've shared. And that good information naturally lent itself to great marketing because I could lead with, don't buy a property with me. Do you want to learn how student rentals work? Do you want to learn how you can buy an apartment building? Do you want to learn all the mistakes that we've made? Do you want to learn how to get cash flow in Toronto? I can lead with all these things right up front. And my competition's really low. Like there's nobody competing out there. 
Mm -hmm. And then I can build a database of people who are raising their hands and identifying themselves as, yeah, I am somewhat interested in what you have to say. And then if I follow up with those people repeatedly and forever, some of them are going to convert into new clients for me. And I'm operating in a world that is really not that competitive. Mm -hmm. So the education component was what we started with. And it was maybe somewhat selfish, but we were trying to serve because we, Patrick, we were the, Nick and I spent a lot of money that we didn't have on gurus who would fly into town and teach you how to be like a real estate millionaire overnight. And like, we realized, wow, we, we knew more than the guru because we had already been doing real estate for five or six years. And then they left town and we couldn't do what they were saying. We tried, I did bag signs, you know, like all the buy houses for, like I did, we've gone through the whole real estate journey. And so I just realized, oh, there's no one really going to do the long game. Like, how about if we play the long game? Like we'll tell people, here's all the things we've learned. We're not perfect. Here's what we can share with you. And by the way, if you do business with us, we will never leave your side. If you have a problem on Monday, we're still here. Call us, you know, complain to us. We will solve the problem with you. So much so that when Nick and I started this business with our first clients, we would go to the tenant board in Ontario with our investors and we would represent the investor. And Patrick, we didn't know we were not allowed to do that. We just did it. So we just started doing this. And like three years into it, some adjudicator goes, you know, are you guys like licensed paralegals? And we're like, no, we just, these are our clients and, you know, they're a little scared to come and be here. So we're representing them. <laughs> the adjudicator's like, you, well done. you can't do this. Like, what? You're not licensed to do uh, what you're doing. Yeah, better to so ask we, forgiveness than permission. Yeah, so absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, so we just led with this strategy of give good information, lead with education. So it was a quasi mix of, we wanted to lead with the education, but we were also using it for marketing. Mm -hmm. So we did from day one, we led with education. You know, it's interesting is that, you know, I've observed Rockstar a little bit from afar, although we play in the same space with the Real Estate Investment Network. But, you know, there's something to be said for longevity. There's something to be said for the message. And to your point is that as many uh, realtors that play in that education space, it's always money driven and deal driven. I don't want to say always. It, it often is. In other words, you know, come on in, I'll teach you how to buy real estate, I'll teach you how to analyze a deal. And oh, by the way, I just happen to have the perfect deal for you, whether it's perfect or not. It was it was that kind of and, and they come, they go. And and it's it, and being in the education space, it was sometimes or it's often hard to watch that because you know where it's going to go. But having said that, in the world of Rockstar, you know, you right from the start came out of the gate. And I love the fact that, you know, you're alongside the client. You're there. You're not going anywhere. You're there tomorrow. You create a tribe. You've got a community. You can't go too offside without the whole world knowing about it when you have the community that you guys have. You have to play and you're, you know, you're driving an integrity-based sale because you're there and you're living with the consequences of your client being right next to you at some point. So I love that model and you obviously pulled it off brilliantly because you're still doing what you're doing and you're playing in the space and gone through all the highs and lows economic challenges that we face today and have faced over the, the amount of years that you've played in that space. So I, I love that whole concept and that model. And, and I really appreciate and respect the fact that you and Nick have done what you've done in that space. And you can still stand tall today. And reputationally, you know, there's you're pretty bulletproof, you know, at the end of the day, you're here, you're growing, you're expanding, you do great events, and you have great topics. Now, did you stay really focused in that Toronto GTA slash Southern Ontario? Did you ever morph or have you morphed into the US? It seems to me you have, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, so we've been approached multiple times to take Rockstar right across Canada, and we've always just um, denied it. We've never been interested in it. We thought there's more to serve right here in the Toronto area than we are currently working on. And as a lifestyle, we just didn't want to go down. It just didn't jive with what how we wanted to live. Um, so we've always kind of stayed local, but we've had clients over, you know, 15 years now ask or longer, I guess, ask us for U.S. properties. And we never ventured into the U.S. because we, we had tons of friends in the U.S. and we had some real estate connections in the U.S., but we never had a team that we could hand people off to that we felt could do it all. So we never ventured into the U.S. and, you know, our clients were, have been knocking at the door for U.S., 
you know, us to refer people to the U S and we just said no. But finally, you know, we, we, we knew, um, there's, there's someone we're partnered up, well, not partnered up. It's his business that we refer people to Jim Shields down in Florida. And we've known him for, I guess it's been about 15 years and we know him so well now that we trust him. And he put together a really great team in the last five years, I would say, where he took a lot of parts of his business and has property management and they're building new homes and they're basically doing it all. So now we have a team that when we hand somebody off, we know they're in good hands. So in the last 24 months, less, I guess, 18 months, we have started having some of our clients go down to the U.S. and buy some properties that we're handing off down into Florida. That's where uh, Jim's team's doing most of his work. And we are doing prop educational tours with Canadian investor clients down in Florida. So we're not just handing them off. We're saying, you know what? We will go to Florida with you. We'll go look at the properties with you. Um, so actually next Friday, we're going with another group of investors down into Florida to do that. So yeah, we are venturing into the U S a little bit right now, but most of our business still like 90, 95% of it is right in the greater Toronto, Hamilton, kind of the golden horseshoe around Lake Ontario, that area. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about what you, I want to diverge a little bit only because I've got your ear and I know that you've got a hot date night with your wife tonight. So I don't want to respect that. <laughs> and so when you look at what going on in let me let me back up a little bit you know first i know that you guys pay attention to what's going on economically you look at global macro you look at what's happening in the world today especially since all along i, I realize that you can't play in the space that you play in without understanding what drives real estate the economic fundamentals that make things work and make the world go around and of course i think you know my observation of you particularly just in how I follow you on social media. And I know myself just how much we've learned about that. So when you look at what's going on right today, global macro, specifically a little bit about how you see what's going on in Southern Ontario, perhaps Gold North Shoe specifically, when you, when we see interest rates at, you know, long-term highs, we see Bank of Canada, we see debt, we see a, a just a fucked up government. Like, how are you, playing in that space these days? What are you, or what kind of guidance are you giving, if any? How do you see the world these days? Maybe you can just go into any of those, those avenues if you want, Tom. Yeah, I think we're going through one of the greatest wealth transfers that I'm ever going to live through. That if you don't own assets in a debt-based world today, that unfortunately your income is not going to keep up with the transfer of wealth from those who own assets from those, sorry, who do not own assets to those who do own assets. And that's the reality that we're living in. And we tell a lot of our clients that like, if we're sitting in this room and there's, you know, 50 people right in front of here, uh, in front of me right now, if there's 25 people who own some good assets and 25 people who don't, well, if we come back two years from now, the ones who own the assets are going to be quote unquote worth more. And that is the wealth transfer. The 25 of you who don't own the assets, unfortunately, with no fault of your own, to no fault of your own, are going to have less um, financial purchasing power. And that's what we're living through in, in, in Ontario and, and, and globally. And if you're not set up to protect yourself from that movement, you are going to live a tough life financially. And you can fight against that if you want, but that's the global macro situation that we are all facing. And that's why when we talk about real estate, we're, we always say, hey, listen, real estate's no holy grail here. Nobody wants to be a landlord, really. In my opinion, I don't think I've really met people who's screaming with excitement to become a landlord. It's a defensive move that if you've been fortunate enough to have the ability to have some purchasing power that you want to protect, then you're forced into making some decisions and playing economist on where you put that money. And it shouldn't be that way. Like, we shouldn't have to do that. Like, Patrick should just be able to what he, do what he wants to do and save his money. But because his money loses value and, you know, and, and, and Patrick, I, mean, I think I know you talk about the same kind of thing, like money loses value we can argue about how much it's worth. In my opinion, it's losing value at not 7% compounded annually. It's losing value like 12 to 15% compounded annually. So if you are not beating that hurdle rate with your income or your net worth, you are falling behind. And that kind of led us into looking at real estate as a vehicle that could outpace the debasement of the currencies in the entire Western world and the entire world, really, 
And so that's kind of how we look at the world right now, that we're all trying to outpace this debasement and everyone's kind of figuring out how they're going to do it. And real estate to us is still a vehicle that does it, even though the media is going to vilify you, you will be blamed as part of the reason that housing is unaffordable for the majority. And uh, you should be ready. And, and I think that the, the government's going to come after asset owners whether we want to talk about that or not, it's it, the government just is going to be in a situation where their incomes are going to dry up to the point where anyone who has any sort of assets is going to be fair game, a honeypot to come after. So I think that real estate investors should realize that their, their assets are likely going to be taxed higher and higher. And it also led me down a path to something like Bitcoin, which I dismissed. Like I laughed at Bitcoin for many years. I thought, hey, I used to work at a database company. Like, if anyone's going to get it, I'll get it, <laughs> you know? And I just laughed at it. Like I laughed at it. I thought, hey, well, how about we start the rock star coin? How about that? I remember saying that to Nick in like 2016 or something. I'm like, oh, we'll start the rock star coin. What about that? And just laughing. And then in the pandemic 2020, looking into the technology and how that, you know, is set up and understanding that more deeply, we started talking about that in this business for the last four years as well. So I think our business, Patrick, has really just become, how can we educate people to how the financial system is set up? How can we explain to people that it's like running on a treadmill, and if you're not beating 15% compounded annually, you're likely falling behind, and you need to do something about it? It is a it is a strange world in that regard. And the education component of it, I mean, you, like me, I'm sure, have just studied the shit out of it. Like you've really had to make a concerted effort to learn what you've learned based on what you've already known. But now you had to expand into a whole different way of thinking and looking at the world. I mean, we used to, you know, I know that for me in the pandemic, uh, you know, since the pandemic, you re I've really come to realize just how small Canada is. I always knew it was small, but you realize, I mean, literally, it's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a meme that we're not a rounding error anywhere in the world. But I mean, ultimately, that's it. We're just so small. We don't matter. But we're living here. We love our country and we're trying to keep loving it and trying to stay ahead of the game that's being played out there. I'll, sh I'll share a quick story with you about uh, Bitcoin. So... My wife, Stephanie, so we get locked down. We live in the country and we're, you know, we're kind of looking at the world going around and I'm sitting there one day and she goes, and, and Bitcoin had become a bit of a conversation after the pandemic. I don't know why. I don't remember how we got into it or why it started showing up. I think just of all the stuff that was going on in the world and conspiracies and all the shit. Anyways, I'm sitting there one day and she goes, you know something? I, I think I own a couple of Bitcoin Mike, her brother, had bought them for her. He was an early adopter of just everything. He was an IT guy. And so they had, he had showed her how to buy a couple of Bitcoin back in, I think, 2016. And wow. I go, well, where are they? And she goes, I don't know. I th they're, they're on some platform. So I'm like texting your brother and my brother-in-law. I go, dude, where did you guys, where is it? And he goes, oh, we put it on Coinbase or whatever platform it was. And she goes, I go, great. So I bring it all up and, and, I, and I go, what's your password? She goes, I have no <laughs> idea, no <laughs> clue to get onto the platform. So anyways, I'm going, could it be this? Could it be that? And I'm going through all these passwords. We go through everything that she's ever used, everything that we've got written down in LastPass, all this, stuff, everything. And I'm sitting there. Okay, you talk about meditation because we talked a little bit about meditation early on. So... For no reason, I was just like breathing through the frustration of it. And uh, I did a little meditation in that moment. And a password came into my head. It was a password that she had shared with me frick a long time ago that it's a weird password. It's a kind of a number name kind of thing. And I didn't even tell her. It just showed up for me. And I wonder if it could be this. And I put it in there and boom. And at the time I went, so there you go. I said, you owe me half of $36,000, by the way. <laughs> it was like that. So we had a little laugh about that, but that opened up the door to me playing a lot in the, in the uh, Bitcoin slash crypto space and all the things that we've been doing up until then. But anyway, so I, I share that story. It was kind of funny how that all unfolded and uh, where, the, where the journey went since then. So I, I, 
but at the time I was like you, you know, it was her brother-in-law and her, and I was not paying attention. I'm going, okay, you guys, whatever. And, and I literally <laughs> totally. did not pay attention to it. So here we so are Patrick, today. What, what role does meditation currently play in your life? This is active for you right now? I, yeah, it's something that I go, I kind of, I'm in and out of. We, we meditated for many years. We did transcendental meditation back. We trained 30-ish years ago. And it's always been a part of my life, some version of meditation all the time. Not always a TM mantra kind of stuff. I've done different versions of it. But for me, I go in and out of that practice. Stephanie, first, and I, and I was that way too for many, many years. I would sit up in bed. And before I got out of bed, that's what I did. I, was, I had my meditation and I would meditate for 20 minutes and did that a couple times a day. We were very, very, it was a, something we did on an ongoing basis. To this day, Stephanie still does that. And she's very consistent with that. I'm not as consistent, mm -hmm. but I go in and out of it. When I, for me, it's about getting grounded, number one. Number two, when I'm looking for answers, to be honest with you, you know, when I'm looking for answers, I can go to meditation and uh, it seems to show up for me. And when so I, I, I'm curious then, how, how do you get the answers when you meditate? Because when I meditate, I use it, uh, I guess the style of meditation that I was taught included a lot of visualization. And um, how do you use it to get answers? So meditation for me, okay, so busy brain, like we get I think many people get, you know, monkey brain and, and there's lots of chatter going on up there. And especially if you've got lots going on. So the world of meditation, everybody's looking for that moment of silence. I'm not. I know that what I'm trying to do is defrag the hard drive and I can defrag by either journaling, which I do, uh, but also I can defrag by meditation, which is to say, OK, thoughts come. I just don't hang on to those thoughts. They come, they go, they you observe, you let them go, let them go, let them go. Just don't, you know, go back to the breath. Some may say that some. Uh, some people do a breath meditation. I go back to my mantra. And, and ultimately, it is just defragging and letting and cleaning up the thought process. Uh -huh. When you do that, that's where brilliance lives. And, you know, as a coach in, in the space of professional and personal development, you know, we have all the answers. My job as a coach is not to give you my opinion. It's not to give you the answers. It's to ask you the questions that I need to ask you because I believe that you have the answer and I can guide and I can do certain things. That's just how I operate. But I believe and I know that I have the answers. I just got to take the time. I have to actually take the time to ask myself the right questions. Our life is a reflection of the quality of the questions we ask ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the quality of the questions is really important. And we think it's, we ask this we always ask the top level questions, the easy question. It's like, how do I fix this? Well, that's not the question. You know, you got to go deeper in your question. So meditation takes me in, down into that path. And, and so for me, it generally works. You know, generally I get something away from that. Now it doesn't happen. It, it doesn't, ha I have to be consistent with my meditation, by the way, because I got a really busy brain depending on what's going on. So it's, it takes a while to clean that mess yeah. up. Same, same. Okay, I have a I have a question for you. I'd, I'd love your opinion on it. Sorry, and I, I don't mean to hijack your podcast, but I'm really interested in your thoughts here. I've had a couple moments in my life where, through meditation, I've come up with some, you know, future visualization or some goal manifestation of my personal future that I wanted to exist. And sometimes that was very specific. So, for example. When I was at Oracle, I had, I went into sales and I thought I had ruined my life because I went into straight sales and, uh, I had a young family and my salary, I actually took a salary decrease to go into straight sales from a technical role. I took a salary decrease with the potential for hire with commissions. And when I went into that role, I really started meditating. I think just because I was freaking out and I really needed to defrag my brain, like you're saying. And I started to have very specific goals around my quota and what I was going to hit from a sales target. And I remember having this one strong desire to hit a certain number, which isn't like me. I'm not really driven by financial goals, but, but in this regard, in this area, I really wanted to hit this number. And, um, a week before the, the, the fiscal year end, I had two or three large deals fall apart on me, like so large that it was very clear that to anyone else that my quota was not going to be met. And I remember because I was meditating very consistently, 
I just knew I was going to hit my number and I let it go where I, where I remember thinking, wow, those deals just fell apart. I know I'm going to hit my number. I can't wait to see how this comes together. Sure. And I was like excited when you hear me and it did, it did come together and I blast, I ended up being the top, you know, uh, I ended up like 203% of my, of my, uh, of my quota. I smashed it. I, I made, you know, more money. I, I think I was 29 years old uh, than I could ever have dreamed in that sales role. When you hear me say that, what comes to mind for you? What, what, what was that? Well, in, number one, I go, I'm, I'm not surprised. That's, you know, part of, you know, meditation is about tapping into consciousness. We're all just consciousness. We're all just energy, you know. So ultimately, meditation, whether we're aware of it or not, is just us tapping into, you know, into the energy, into consciousness. So, you know, whether you believe in manifestation or you don't believe in manifestation, it, is, it doesn't really matter. If you take the time and you're into meditation and you start to commit to it, you are in fact tapping into a, a higher power, whatever you want to call that higher power. Some would call it God or Buddha. And I, you know, refer to it as universe or consciousness and that's how it is. So none of it surprises me, but that's what you're tapping into. You're setting that intention. So when you set those kinds of intentions, that's where opportunities show up. So in other words, you don't know how it was going to happen. You just felt really confident it was going to happen. You just at a cellular level or at some level, you just said, this is going to happen. I and you. Yeah. And what happens in that case generally is that the weirdest coincidences happen. And all of a sudden, you know, when there's a phrase that I'm sure you've heard before, it's not new, but it's when you understand what's possible, when you believe there's something possible, then opportunities show up. If you don't believe that something is possible, there's it's almost impossible for for you to see a possibility or to see an opportunity because that opportunity would be right in front of you and you wouldn't recognize it as an opportunity so when you open up to it that's what starts to happen is opportunities things start to manifest because you see it and and you attract it so i mean it sounds a little airy fairy maybe a little bit <laughs> esoteric but to me it's, it totally does even when i share it with you it sounds airy fairy <laughs> yeah but it's but you know something i i live in a world where my wife is like that that's these are conversations i have on a regular basis with her and and if you don't know my wife but if you saw what she has manifested in her life given what the the hand she was dealt you would go what the hell? How do you do that? You know, so I live with her. <laughs> I'm married to her. And I still go, how the hell did you do that? Like, how does that happen? You know, so anyways, she's sometimes jokingly called a witch, but in a very, very nice way. So then one more question for you. When people you work with focus exclusively on meditation or visual visualization, how do you get them to marry that with actual action? So I don't work with people who are only focused on that. So my body of work that I work with and, you know, and this is part of the observation that I see and hear in you is that at a very early age, you were grounded in your values, whether you were conscious of them or not, you knew your values. And, and so when you start to understand what your core values are, you know what you stand for. And when you start to stand for things because of your core values, that is the direction that you take your life. And that is how you live a pretty great life. Ultimately, uh, people get out of whack. And, and you know, within our own coaching program, you know, we do a program called, uh, I was talking a little bit offline, you know, clarity equals velocity. But you can't have clarity until you understand what your core values are, what your driving values are. And that's what keeps you on a path and, and really starts to create a great life. It's why you were able to say, this corporate shit isn't for me. It's why you were laying awake at night going, how can I live my life if I'm locked down like this? Now, at a very young age, it's because your highest value was going to be family. It was going to be freedom. It was going to be something that wasn't about sitting in a cubicle in an office someday or even a corner office. It was about freedom of your time and choice or whatever those values are. You could narrow those down. And when you start to understand what your core values are, and even within your business, within Rockstar, you have some core values, one of which is value, one of which is uh, staying true to your clients, which is an integrity-based conversation always. And integrity is about who you are when nobody's looking. And so for you, running an operation where you've got brokers and other, you know, other outside influences, 
you've got a team of people that are committed to one fundamental thing, one of your highest values, whatever those mission, whatever that mission statement might translate as. Um, I think it was uh, your, your life, life, your, your terms. terms. And so that's uh, your life, your terms. You know, mine, without knowing yours, by the way, mine is being your greatest self, living your best life. And so I operate from that. That's a purpose-driven high value and highest value. So my decisions live in that box. If it doesn't serve that for my clients or me, I'm not interested. You know, JG, who I work with, if it's not fun, I'm not doing it. Full stop. He doesn't care. <laughs> but you can make a million bucks. I don't care. If it's not fun, I'm not doing it. So that's, that's, that's a, a statement. In it. So back to your original question is that people that, you know, individuals who are just aren't clear on their values, they're all over the place. They're all chasing something. They're going after money. They're, they're going after, uh, you know, notoriety, you know, they're, they're living into their, how will people see me? You're pretty clear, you know, you're pretty clear on who you were. So meditation, you know, when you, I was going to say, you know, it was a gift your mom gave you. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You know, for at a sure. young age. And I, I can't help but believe, and it would be a story I'm telling myself because I have no evidence of it other than I'm talking to Tom, who's talking about meditation this many years later, who's created a pretty great life. And of course, it's got all its challenges that you've got through and all of the things that you've faced because you've been grounded in your values and you make decisions from that place. So I don't know if that answered what you asked me, but a little bit of a long winded rant. Yeah, no, it was great. Values based conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm forever grateful for, you know, I, I didn't know we were going to talk about my mother on this podcast. But yes, we, I'm forever grateful. I mean, she started working with us, Patrick. We, we started growing and we had our first assistant. We trained her to also be the person who processed all the real estate transactions, but also fill up our training classes. That was the education, the marketing education that we were leading with. So when we finally just outgrew this, everything was falling apart. Our processes were breaking everywhere. And we went to our mom, who was the bookkeeper for our father's business. And she always kept everything to the penny. Like she was, sure. she was like, born for, <laughs> yeah, she was born for that role. Yeah. So we said, can you please, like, we are, please help us it, just for six months, you know, just for a little bit. She'd already been basically retired at that point. And uh, she came and I guess stayed with us for like seven years. And uh, at one point she said, uh, early on, she's like, I'm going to go to Brazil because I'm going to meet a shaman and do some ayahuasca. I, this, yeah, I had never heard sure. of this. I had ayahuasca never journey. heard. Yeah. yeah, I never heard of this. It wasn't trendy at the time. It was like no one had ever whispered this to us. And uh, we're like, okay, you know, that's our mom. That's what she does. I'm like, do we get a phone number? Or do we like, are you just roughly in the area of Brazil? You know, like, <laughs> and uh, so we've always been exposed to these kind of just maybe wild or different type of thinking and different way to live ideas. I'm forever grateful for it, for sure. It's like, huge. Very, very... You know, here's the thing about it, you know, is that uh, we have... Men have no clue just how influential their mothers are yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what it means. I mean, you know, like I often have conversations with people and I go, you know, so your son, for example, I think it was your son that you mentioned you had a mm -hmm. son, right? Yep. Yes. So, you know, the question I would, I'll sometimes ask a client when they're dealing with some family issues or whatever might be going on, I, I often will ask the question, so where do you think your son learns how to teach or learns how to treat his girlfriends or women in general, or how he will treat his uh, future wife. Where do you think he learns that? Most will say from me, from the dad. Not true. He learns it from the mom. And do you know how he learns it? He learns it from mom because he witnesses how mom responds to dad. That is. So, Mom doesn't put up with certain things from dad, whatever that put up with me, or she embraces certain things that dad does. He goes, oh, that's cool. That's all registering subconscious. It's why so many, you know, so you know, when you look at some of the, the negative things that show up in families, whether it be, you know, abuse. So in other words, a son of a father who's abusive will often be abusive, especially if the mom stayed in the relationship, because that makes it okay. That makes it okay. I know it's a heady thing, right? But mm -hmm. we, we as men, so you, you as a man learned how to treat your wife and how to treat women from your mom. 
Yeah, when you lay it out like that, it makes it absolute sense. And when I reflect back on, yeah, my my upbringing, my family's history, like I could see that. So, yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? And it's an interesting, yeah. and it's not all that. It's not all or none, yeah, but it's sure. a huge impact of it. So yeah. when I say, you know, she gave you a nick, I mean, it took you on a whole different journey. <laughs> and, and, and oh, it's, boy. you know, at some level, you start to understand you know, the values that you have, she instilled some values in you and that's where you make decisions and whether you're conscious of it or not. And I say this to people all the time, you know, whether you're conscious of it or not, you're living a set of values, you know, and, and hopefully they're yours because a lot of people live other people's, you know, they live other people's values. And, and, and most often it's a set of values that, parents have you know that's why we see kids I want, I want to tell you a funny story that's somewhat related i remember when i was starting this business and i was leaving the tech jobs i remember a vp had made us watch at oracle a sales presentation i think it was a coach of notre dame football mm -hmm. and he said listen we're gonna we're gonna run this organization with these three principles you're always going to do the right thing you will treat others as you treat yourself and you will give 110 percent and I remember thinking, I was like studying integrity. I, I, I remember thinking, I want to be a person of integrity, but I don't really know what that means. Most people don't. <laughs> Funny yeah. is most people don't, Tom, by the way. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, <laughs> so this was what I was going, I was, yeah. I was like 26 at this time. And I was like, I want to be a person of integrity, but I don't really know how to be one. <laughs> and I remember watching this video and I thought, those are going to be my principles. I'm going to live with those three principles. And from that day I did. And when we started Rockstar, we we told everyone, we told everyone, you know, it was just Nick and myself. And then it was like four of us. And then it was six. And now, now there's 60 licensed people here. And when we started it and we started growing, we said, listen, real estate is messy. And other people in the real estate business, they're messy too. And we're not, now we're, we're not saying we're perfect by any means, but as we grow, you don't always need to reach out to Nick and myself. If you live by these three principles and let us tell you them. <laughs> and we laid them out and I told everyone, it's actually from this football coach that I left. <laughs> I heard these principles, but, but I said, it defines it. And if, if you, if we do wrong by a real estate investor, you don't have to call myself. You don't have to call Nick. If the right thing to do is X, Y, and Z or X, Y, and Z, you know, go ahead and do it. Even if it costs us money, go ahead and do that because it's the right thing to do. And we've always kind of lived by that. And it's made our business kind of just light. You know, we haven't had to like worry. We just thought, and by the way, if you don't live by these three principles and we kind of catch that, well, we're just not a good fit. So if you can't see yourself by living by these principles, you're not going to be a fit here at Rockstar. And that's kind of defined our little business. And uh, it's it's been something that's been really meaningful over the years. You know, so hearing you say that, like, it, it kind of all makes sense. Well, dude, I mean, you you are you, you guys are crushing it because of that. I mean, you've I get business business is up and down. You have the challenges and not everything's great. But, you know, the, the point of it is, is that you always come back to center because those are your values. You, you did something that. One, you know, I've, I've got a business that I've owned for 40 years that I haven't, I literally haven't been in part of a day to day for since 2006. You know, I, I, I've got a great team of people, but culturally, I just was in Edmonton yesterday. I flew in this back in this morning, as a matter of fact, but I'm meeting with my general manager yesterday and we go back to one fundamental time and that is culture. And you designed your culture, whether you did it by accident or I, not. Yeah, I, was, I think it was slightly by accident. I'm yeah. just going to admit that right now. Right? Sure. <laughs> but, but good for you because most businesses needed that need to have that accident. I actually do, I go in and do uh, kind of one day workshops with teams of culture. And it's a really fundamental, to me, fundamental exercise, which is to what are the values of the business? What is what do we stand for? And what are we not going to put up with? And who as we as a culture? Like, what do we want our culture to be about? And when you get through all of those exercises with the team and everybody else commits to that's the culture, uh, and, they, and then you create the environment for it, which what is what you've done. You've also created the environment for it. So you've set people up to succeed with the culture, living those values, you know, and, and, and defining what integrity is for them and for your business. And, uh, and I love the part that you added going, yeah, and if you don't align with those values, I get it. You'll just have to go away because it doesn't work. And people have self-selected out of the business. You know, some people who haven't jived with that and we don't tend to attract 
people really that don't don't get that. So yeah, it ha- it has it has been somewhat accidental. I'm not going to say I was very intentional about that, but I did know the importance. Like it just. I go by feeling a lot. Nick and I are so different. Nick's the numbers guy. Yeah, yeah. Like I will buy a property. I'll look at a piece of real estate and I'll say, Nick, I don't know. This is, tell me again, what's the income? And what's, oh yeah, no, like this looks like this is, let's just buy it. (laughs) (laughs) And Nick will be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like what's the cap rate? What are we looking? What are the numbers here? What's the current mortgage? (laughs) We're totally two two different, uh, different things, but that just felt like the right thing to do. So it's not like it was completely intentional, but it definitely has been a, a really thing uh, that we're important. And we have had it used just maybe I would say twice. I had it used against me where someone felt like they were wrong and they said, well, you've always said that you should do the right thing. And then they defined what the right thing for me to do was for them. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a rather interesting approach. I thought, okay, I'll give you credit that you're using this uh, like to serve you here but let me step out of this. I really don't believe that's the right thing to do in this re- in this regard. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it has been it has been used just two out of the you know in all our years there has been two incidents where people tried to put that back in a weird way, and I thought this is interesting. We almost need like a referee here to decide what the right thing to do here is. Where I clearly knew the right thing to do was not to do what they were suggesting, mm-hmm. and in sometimes in life I have proceeded to accept that and just wash myself and move on because I didn't want that energy around me. So then I decide, okay, this is the right thing for me to do, even though I know factually this is wrong. And yeah, anyway, I'm branching. I, I'm, I'm getting, I'm going off into a tangent. No, but it's great. It's a good conversation. I mean, I think ultimately when we, you know, talk about values because it's one of my big conversations, especially right now, but uh, be, because of the programs that we're launching and have launched. But the point of it is, Tom, is this, is that Everybody ha- runs a set of values. Everybody does. And there's no right values and wrong values. They're just our values. My values may be different than yours. Yours aren't right, mine are wrong. They're just different values. That means we don't mesh. Okay, go away. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means we don't operate in the same totally. set of values. Yeah. That's it. It's not any more yeah. complicated than that. And, you know, so when you get uh, the integrity part of it is that when you're living into a set of values and somebody comes along and puts a deal on the table and all of a sudden you go, oh, I'll adopt those values again, consciously, unconsciously doesn't matter. Then that's the integrity conversation. And that's where you where people operate out of integrity. And you can only ever be out of integrity with yourself, by the way. You can't be out of integrity with me. You can only ever be out of integrity with yourself. Those is, and, and I can tell you that in relationships and business and partnerships and everything, friendships, uh, those relationships uh, almost always break down. And, and I would almost, sure. I, I don't like to use the word always, but in this case, the, at some level, they always do break down. Yeah. And I've also seen, I'm sure you've seen it in this real estate industry as well. We were engaged with another business early on where we really could have used the money and they knew we were in the education space. And at that time we were already getting about 300, 350 clients in, in a room a few times a year. And we were approached by a company that said they would, um, quickly earn us a six figure sum if they could come in and present to our audience, our clients and sell this, like, basically it was like, get rich quick kind of real estate thing that they knew the conversions of it. And, you know, they knew for a fact it would make this much money and that it would split this with us. And at the time it was going to be a very substantial amount of money for us. Like, you know, with the first five years of running rockstar were super tight. Like the first three years were excruciating. The first five years there was, you know, it, it was not, not, not an easy journey. And, uh, we could have used it. And I remember Nick and I hung up the phone. It was a conference call and we thought, wow, that person externally shows this, like that they're full of integrity and they even tell people how much integrity they have. Mm. Like they go on to make this thing about, and we thought, this is so interesting. Like behind the scenes, they're here about the money mm-hmm. And they were telling us like the sequence of events and how to do it. And it was just very manipulative in our, and that was our opinion. And we thought, oh my God, like that's, that's dead to us. We are not proceeding and we never just want to be associated or speak to that person ever again. And we never did. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, you're, you're tested in business. And I feel like, yeah, it's just, I've seen that over and over again. 
And uh, it's been important to us to just kind of try our best to, to, to live by our principles. And I feel like what it's given myself and Nick is that we could sleep at night. Yeah. Like I want to sleep at night and feel light. And, uh, and for anyone listening to this, it's not like I'm saying we're perfect. We make mistakes 100%. We just try to fix the mistakes that we make and apologize if we, if we made the mistakes. Well, I think at the end of the day, I mean, you're entrepreneurs that, and, and that really is about trying things. And sometimes you're going to, you know, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying anything new. Right. So that's ultimately what I look at it as. And, and as long as you're making the decisions that you're making from the best place that you know how, and, and in your case of doing the right thing for you, then uh, you're, you're not going to go too far wrong. Uh, my mistakes are always expensive. That's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We've made some expensive mistakes as well. Yeah, a little tired um, of that. Okay. So I, I really love that conversation, by the way, Tom, but I, I want to take us back, kind of bring us back to center about, you know, when we talk about store of value in real estate, we look at what's going on economically. I'm with you in terms of, you know, real estate, even that language now is, is a store of value given what's happening with debasement of currency. And we look at, and I've and I look at what's happening economically in the world of real estate, you know, uh, aside from interest rates, even qualifying for a mortgage has become problematic for, let's say, a do-it-yourselfer who's going to buy a duplex, even triplex, whatever. You know, they get, it's, it's hard to get deals done. It's hard to find deals that make sense on, on the math side of it. But, you know, I'm saying, and one of the things within Rain that we've always taught is that there's really not a bad time to invest in real estate. There's just a bad strategy, the wrong strategy within the cycle of what's happening in real estate. And right now, when I look at the challenges that people have, a cost of entry, interest rates, finding deals that make sense, cash flow, unless you're going to Calgary or, you know, right now, <laughs> given what's happening, current market conditions, I'm sure you see Ontario slightly different because of the game that you play. But I'm suggesting to many people right now is that, there are some really kick-ass, very legitimate private REITs out there, whether they be a REIT, an LP, GP. Uh, you can get in relatively light. You don't have to worry about management. You don't have to worry about big down payments, qualifying for a mortgage. I don't know if that's a game that you guys are playing or not. Like when I say game, is it is it is strategy that you're in, uh, using right now or, or recommending? Where I'm just curious where are you at on that page? Yeah, I guess slightly torn because um, the the reason I like real estate so much is you own the asset directly. So um, I I really feel that that's really important, and I think going forward it's going to be perhaps even more important. So I I try to encourage people to think of creative strategies to be able to pick up properties that they own directly. Um, but we have um, we 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 do do some work with. A company called Greybrook out of Toronto. Are yep. you familiar with them? Oh, yeah, very. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so a bunch of our clients will do investments in them, and it's not it's not a REIT. It's more like you're participating with the development of the project. So there's no no cash flow to it. You're in. You could be in for five or seven years. So for some people who are not going to get into real estate investing because they can't qualify or don't think the numbers are right or don't have the ability to put the investment in a property to make the numbers right, then we'll guide them to something like Greybrook. Brook. Um, so we will kind of go back and forth like that, but we really do want to try to help people to own investments um, directly. That, By the way, I'm on the exact same page. What I'm looking at in this conversation and was just the, given what's happening in the world, again, about wealth preservation, about a store of value, about putting your money to work in a store of value called real estate. How, do, how can we do that? Looking at the different options to do that. And again, I'm on the same page as you are. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. So we've done, uh, so some, yeah, it's, it's so, it, it's so difficult because it's dependent on, you know, what's the age, sure. what's the short term objectives, yeah, yeah, yeah. what's the long term goals. But I yeah. guess, yeah, we, we still have been doing stuff here in Ontario. We've been doing a lot of student rental properties. Uh, the student rentals are just absolutely, and, and this is around bigger universities like Queens and Western and McMaster, like a student rental room will currently rent out anywhere from $900 to $1,200 a room. Mm -hmm. 
So you have a, you know, a five bedroom or a seven bedroom student rental. So we've done hundreds of student rental properties around Western with rockstar clients. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll work with small developers who um, will knock down houses and build a beautiful purpose built student rental and buy these things. But yes, you have to qualify to buy, to buy that kind of property. Other investors are doing things in Hamilton where they're adding us not only a second suite, but they're adding now a laneway to the second suite. So now they're getting, you know, 6,000 to $7,000 a month in rental income on a property that 15 years ago, we would have got $1,200 a month. But yeah, you have to qualify for that. So we've just been doing overall less business, Patrick. So with clients, it's just been a lot of less business and telling people to sit on their hands until they can get into the game. And I think now the way the world is structured, like you can see today, the Federal Reserve, I think was in, or no, today was the jobs report in the US that came out weaker than expected, kind of setting us up for the Fed to say, oh, you know what, we didn't want to raise, we didn't want to lower rates. But I can see the narrative starting to change. CBC had an article about the Bank of Canada sort of hinting that maybe we're going to be able to lower rates. So I think the, the people that have been blocked out of the real estate market in the next six months and through the next 18 months, I think there's going to be a window for them to get back in. Mm -hmm. so so do I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but no, that's no, no. Kinda... It's, a, it's just a good conversation. I think that, you know, so let me ask you, well, only because you brought it up in interest rates. Do you have, I have a view of where interest rates are going in terms of, uh, are they coming down or not? Uh -huh. What is your view? Do you have a, a view of what you think yeah. interest rates are going to do this year? Yeah, they can only do two things. They must come down. If they do not come down, inflation must must be much higher than it is today. And because I because I think the the Federal Reserve and, and the Bank of Canada don't look at inflation as the way I look at inflation or measure inflation, they're going to cut rates. They're going to cut rates. We need to have negative real rates in a world of this much debt. Mm. So we, you can tell me all day long that rates need to stay higher and real estate prices are too high. It's the wrong time to cut rates. The math doesn't work. At 120% or 130% of GDP, debt to GDP, you need to cut rates. We can't have the debt growing faster than the gross domestic product of these economies. So you are going to have to cut rates. And if you don't cut rates, which is possible, it would mean that inflation is ripping higher than it is today. So to me, those are your two choices. And because I feel like the reported inflation, like all jokes aside, like I think inflation is higher than whatever we're being told. Of course it is. But, yeah. but at the reported inflation, if the reported inflation is coming down, which it looks like in Canada's next time that we report and in the U.S. that's going to both be slightly lower, I think they're setting up the narrative to say, oh, yeah, you know what? We have it under control. Um, the job market now magically is coming in weaker after months of it being so strong and then being updated after the fact to be less than initially reported. So it was like through this whole last, what, year, there's been these great job reports coming out of the U.S. And then 30 days later or 60 days later, they're reported, they're changed to be reported lo lower. And now we decide to get a report that's magically low. You can't set this up any better to me. So I think we're setting up a narrative to have lower rates I think in Canada, we're probably going to have, you know, a full point and a half this year with only like what, ha about half the year left, Yeah, which seems crazy. Like that to me seems crazy. Even hearing me say that, I realize someone listening to this is going to say, well, Tom's been wrong for two years, which I have, and he's going to be wrong again. <laughs> so if I'm wrong again, I so be it. But that's kind of what I'm operating under the, you know, my operating right now is thinking, yeah, we're going to see lower rates this year in the U.S. and in Canada. So I'll give you my view of that. So, I mean, listen, I've been wrong too, but we're amongst good company in terms of being wrong. So, you know, it's who, who the hell knows, because there's a part of it where we're using some part of our common sense brain and none of this is common sense. It's all quite nonsensical <laughs> yes. these days, isn't it? And I look at it and I don't think there's going to be a rate decrease this year. I just don't. And there's a couple of reasons I don't. Number one is that on the very initial surface of it, they cut rates and inflation is going to rip higher. And as much as we say, you know, and especially in Canada where we've got this housing issue, I think it's political suicide. So I don't think they're going to rush to do that because right now you think about the money that's sitting on the sidelines waiting, waiting for rates to come down. And I mean, all they have to do is even 
say we're thinking about it and the next thing you know everybody's back in right so i think that they're going to be uh, i don't see it happening i look at what's happening in precious metals i look what's happening in uh, bitcoin uh, crypto space right. even the stock market i go i don't think they're going to drop them it's really hot and then there's a, a fundamental here that i think we can't step over and and that is that we got too many wars going on and it's only going to, I believe they're going to get worse. And I believe the price of oil is really what drives inflation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It's attached to everything and uh, oil has started to tick up, which back in December, I made the call that it would. So far, I'm right. I like being right, but I don't want to be right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love You're saying, right for not good reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that we're going to see, I think we're going to see oil north of a hundred bucks and uh, we'll do that by the end of the year so the point is this they can increase rates or keep them the way they are as long as they want and inflation is not going to come down it's just ultimately it's going to stay high you're not paying less for food you're not paying less for fuel you're not paying less for the things that matter yeah you can go buy a tv cheaper and who gives a shit i mean at the end of the day the cost of living continues to tick up go to a restaurant their price of fuel to get their food to the table is not going down their cost of living or their cost of delivery is not going down panama yes it affects europe and uk blah 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 but we it all is a ripple effect so i think there's a lag that's going to that we're we're going to to feel and lower rates is going to just yeah fuel to the fire so do you think we see higher rates soon no i don't think we're going to see higher rates you, you i think I, we're just going to stumble around in this range yeah i think we're going to stay in this range what we're starting we're we're already starting to see and there's a lag effect that's happening you know this especially in uh in, in the in in toronto slash gta is guys have stopped building and you know yeah. everybody's hit the break and so yeah, you can't plan and so you okay. right so that means construction jobs are going to be less although the federal government's come in and said we're going to build five million homes or whatever the number is that it's so ridiculous it wouldn't matter that the point is is that you know the construction jobs you're going to start to see that unemployment rate tick up and then everybody's going to say you need to drop rates you need to drop rates i don't think they are i think we're into a, okay we're so do you think then that they will put some liquidity in because in the u.s you can look at what's going on with the reverse repo and the treasury general account is at their disposal to just put in several hundred billion dollars of liquidity into their economy in canada do you think we see some kind of liquidity injection that we currently don't see for example the liberal government coming out and saying hey first time home buyers we got this great plan called everybody deserves a home and you can do 70 year amortizations so that you can qualify do we see other some other type of liquidity entering in some other capacity if it's not lower rates who knows what they'll do they'll come up with something we got sure yeah you, we know they'll come up with something they'll yeah. come up with something <laughs> ridiculous is my is, i mean that's it i mean that, that's what i think and i i look at freeland i look at trudeau and i know they're not supposed to be you know having any kind of conversations with uh, macklin but i at the end of the day they are we know that all goes on sure. it's, it's all one big political game in my view and i i hope i'm Full of shit. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm looking okay, so at then it. What about this? In the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, there was two big rounds of inflation spiked up, came down, then spiked back up. In the 1970s, same thing. Big spike of inflation comes down, spikes back up. So when I look at those two scenarios historically, and I'd say, oh, wow, we just had another spike. It gives them cover that the infl reported inflation is coming down to drop rates. And that's kind of what I'm using to come up with this idea that they might drop rates. Like, oh, wow, like they have the cover, even though it's the wrong thing to do, like you're saying. So do you think we just get this other spike? Then when you say gold is kind of signaling some things and oil, do you think inflation, like we're at the bottom now and it's, it's turning around actively right now and six months from now we see much higher inflation? I believe we're going to see much higher mm. inflation in lots of categories. One of the things that in terms of Canada, what might save us, I mean, think about what's driving inflation, what's dri driven inflation that people don't really talk about. You know, we look at GDP per capita and we suck and all the rest of it. But ultimately, when you think about the non-permanent residents that have moved in here. And we just need to stop and think about that. You know, whatever it is, a million people come into Canada more than ever before, you know, and 
there's permanent residents, non-permanent residents, and we can break those numbers down any way you want. What does everybody have to do when they move into a country, move into a city, you know, from another country? They're, they're buying shit. They're, 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 they have to set up house. They have to buy clothes. They have to do what all the things that they're doing. That's all part of what's driving demand. Now, having said that, if they, in fact, follow through with the cuts on non-permanent residents that they're talking about, which will be relatively significant over the next two or three years, that's going to help bring some of that demand inflation down. And, you know, it's not just interest rates that control inflation. And you know, that's only one part of a bigger picture. So that's the way I'm looking at it. And like I say, I'm I'm totally up for discussion around it. That's just how my brain has kind of been unpacking it. But I'm not optimistic about rates coming down. And dude, I own real estate and I've got far too many variable rate mortgages. So I'm so do hoping, we. So, so do we. I'm hoping so like we. hell they come down. <laughs> trust me. But we uh, always go variable. We locked in on one property and now we think that was the best move we ever did in our entire lives, but we've always played with the variable rates. Okay. And by the way, I just got word. Yeah, um, you got to go. I'm just looking no, at no, it. Actually, I just got word that we had the wrong movie time. Oh, okay. So I'm, uh, I, I'm good for another little bit here. Okay, if, good. Okay, if, good, if, good if news. That's okay. Um, I, so I, I just interested then in your thinking here. So rates uh, stay where they are, muddle around here. So Canadian real estate prices, which I know the average Canadian price doesn't exist, but in some way, I'd love to hear your thoughts on where do you see Canadian real estate prices? Pick a market if that's easier. You know, where do you see them a year from now, three years from now? Well, it is it is regional. So uh, I think that there's some things that are unfolding that it's hard to get a read on it. I don't think prices are going to come down dramatically. I think you're going to see some soft spots for sure. But you're headlines are talking about how soft they are but you look at the charts as much or more than i do and you know that ultimately they're down off their peaks of 2022 and you know whatever period of time that was was at we don't have enough the immigration component of it is is still a, a big play right and when we look at ontario i think they're going to be certain markets that come down more just because of the the job factor or lack of i think it's going to get softer on that side of it and people have to go to where there's work and they're going to spend money based on the amount of work that they have or don't have alberta will continue to be very strong given what's happening in alberta uh, you've also got some good leadership in in alberta whether you like danielle smith or not that's leadership and she's making some good calls and as controversial as they are but all the controversies because the two major cities are ndp so you've got big political challenges if you will and and you know debates that are going on but alberta will continue to do well in that regard it's their time their time again oil is doing what it's doing they got uh, pipelines going again their uh, production is I, I think peak and it's a necessary part of what we're doing so alberta will continue to do quite well uh, i would caveat edmonton on that now when you get into ontario man there's going to be is this it. pockets just right? say it it's, just say it well no i think i think well no i think in i think toronto i think that toronto condo market is going to continue to get hammered yeah um i i think that a lot of people are nervous about you know hamilton for example and and that kind of area i'm not i think i think they'll continue to i think it'll continue to remain strong you know uh -huh. for the most part but i think toronto is going to hurt mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting yeah it's a wild world like it's it's a hard for me to can to conceive of real estate prices in this country, and I'll just generalize right across the country, going down in any significant way, when when uh, when I when I, I kind of look at it as the value of the dollar is just going to decrease more and more rapidly, that I can't marry that thinking and that conclusion with lower real estate prices because the real estate prices to me are just a mirror of the value of the Canadian fiat dollar. So if that looks like it's going to lose value and continually lose value and perhaps at a faster pace, it's hard to kind of rectify that Canadian pr uh, real estate prices can come down significantly almost anywhere. I don't, and I agree with you. By the way, I don't think they will. I, I think they'll come down. Yeah, but and I, I, I didn't. I didn't mean that you were saying that. I think. I, I don't think there's going to be. You know, there's so many, and you know, you hang out on Twitter a little bit, and you find out all these guys are. You know, they're they're waiting for a forty percent correction and a fifty yeah, percent correction. Yeah, I see, I see going, it too, and I'm like, guys, I don't, I don't know how you're going to get. It. And I think it might be good. Let's let some people get into the real estate market yeah. that couldn't get into the real estate. I think it would be healthy. Yeah. 
I just don't see but it. Isn't it interesting too? And let's go off on a little bit of a tangent in a minute. So here's the thing, you know, you're like me, you're looking at the market, you're looking at the data, you're going back to what we know in terms of what has always been how you could look at an economy and start to see the future, knowing that, you know, when we look at our long-term real estate success formula, we know that when you've got positive GDP and you've got employment growth and you've got population growth, that all adds up to demand and rentals and all the rest of it, that it, that's what it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And, but now we've got some new information coming in. We've got new ways of looking at the world because we've got global macro conditions that are different than they have been in the past. I think when we look at the fundamentals are the fundamentals, but what we have right now is the influencers and we got huge political influencers. Politics is a, an influencer in the real estate cycle in any cycle. And right now we're right in the throes of it in a big way. And so for the next three or four years, um, I think it's like roll the dice with some of the things and the decisions that are going to get made. So we can't actually, Again, we're trying to use common sense yeah, in a nonsensical yeah. world yeah. and and guide clients and, and support people because that's what our, our you know, this, listen, whether we, we, we don't call ourselves economists, but hell, I think, you know, <laughs> seeing some of your stuff and knowing what I do, we're probably got, we, we'll probably do a better job than some of the economists out there, you know. But you're, having, for, you're forced to be an economist yeah. if you're in real estate. You're forced to. You, <laughs> you know? have to. But like I say, you know, you're, we're trying to use common sense in a nonsensical world, and, and that's tough to do. I think that you have to create a thesis at some level. You look at the world of probabilities and possibilities and, you know, make decisions around it. And you're not going to get it right all the time. So, you know, you diversify where you can, you hedge where you can. And I think that uh, it's going to be painful the next couple of years for sure. And I think we're only just getting into it, by the way. I think that we're just starting down a path of a lot of discomfort. For sure. You Agreed. know, uh, and we're early in and people are already, you know, really struggling and being and, ch and being challenged. And and I think stagflation is going to be a word that we start to hear a lot. Yeah, it's starting to 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 be one. And I think the real estate investing game is changing too. So for example, in Toronto, we see some great things happening where some investors, and, and this is going to unfortunately block out new investors, but it's a space where if you have some experience, the big developers can't compete against you very well. So it's going to present an interesting opportunity for investors who have some experience. So for, for example, in Toronto right now, we see multiple people just entering this game where they're buying a single family home lot subdividing it they're not building like two duplexes they're building two fourplexes side by side on what was a single family lot and then putting legal two-story laneway houses in the backyard so now you've turned one single family into two lots each with five units 10 unit total and now you you have this opportunity and this is something I'm talking to my son about and to some other real estate investors. And we're helping a few investors get into this space right now. You need a different set of contacts. Like when I entered the real estate investing game, Nick and I looked at some student rentals and we're like, oh, this is like seven bedrooms, you know, three, $295 a room times seven. And here's our expenses. Like this works. And we thought we were like financial wizards. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that game has kind of, it still exists, but it is kind of, you know, leaving and we're entering a world where if you have some experience with some contractor connections, some oh. architect experience, you and you do need a bit more capital. So I'm not trying to say this is like for, for everyone. You get these opportunities where we know people now doing this, building a couple of these, selling them to make a profit, and then doing the next project, keeping it, adding it to their portfolio, doing the next one, selling it for a profit, the next one, keeping it in their portfolio. And they're doing it with five or six investors together that are a tight team, all friends. So not a joint venture where like they don't all know each other, tight group of friends who are all committed and they're killing it. Mm. They're absolutely killing it. Mm. And I think, you know, Mattamy Homes can't play in that space. Daniel's group's not playing in that space. The big, the big home developers cannot play in that space. The beginner investors are not really playing in that space. So it's this, this new kind of thing that we see all over the GTA, that if you have that type of wherewithal where you can handle a project like that, wow. You know, you're serving the community by presenting some nice new housing 
and they are the cash flow on those works. But again, you need capital, you need a bit more connections. It's not for the beginner investor. This goes back to what I said earlier on, which is there's not a bad market to invest in real estate. There's just a strategy that has to change. So there's a bad strategy. Yeah, what yeah, you're, what, what's, what's evolving and developing in, in, the, in the spirit of real estate investment and entrepreneurship is some people that are creative, have a little bit of courage, absolutely, can do some math, are going, okay, here's what we're dealing with. We just got to find the solution. Here's the gap that there is. Let's fill that gap. And, and that's how real estate investing continues to be and to make sense is adjusting the strategy given what's happening in the economic conditions, whatever they might be. And, I, and, totally. that's, and it's making me feel like an old guy because these guys are like 29, 30, 31 doing this kind of thing. And they're just killing it. And I'm looking at, oh my gosh, like we couldn't, I, I was nowhere close to doing that when we entered the, you know, and they're just developing. And you got to see these projects, like the, the, the two-story laneway homes that are in the backyard, they are beautiful. They're beautiful. These are I know. absolutely beautiful yeah. homes. Yeah. So they're just killing it and it's helping the community. And it's, it's really just, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people are referring to it as the missing middle type homes. Yep. So yeah, so, big, so big opportunity. We, uh, you know, I'm the first to bash politicians, but when you look at that particular initiative, that could only happen because they change zoning. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so yes. that yeah. has that turned out to be a, a good move when, in, when you look at what's going on now? Yeah, absolutely. Or we, uh, for sure. Across Ontario, it's still municipality by municipality still, even though the provincial government's trying to kind of just pu push that down the throat of everyone. So, we, But overall, yes, it ha it has been for sure. And if we can continue making changes like that at the provincial level, I, yeah, it, it could be great. There, there was talk this year that there was going to be as of right six plexes in Toronto. And that did not go through. I haven't checked lately, so I could be wrong as we're, you know, discussing this right now. But as of a little while ago, that had not gone through yet. But uh, yeah, that just makes the opportunities open up to so much more creative type of real estate investing. Absolutely. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So, Tom, you've been really generous with your time. I had no idea where this conversation was going to go. But the good news was we found a little about you, a little bit about Rockstar. Uh, and as we wind things down, and by the way, I love, listen, I can talk about real estate and economics and politics all day long. It's one of those things that get me fired up. Uh, I have a, a high interest in that and we didn't even get it all done. We, we, I, I, with so many guests, I go, we have to do another show. And uh, I'm sure we can do that. Uh, as we wind things down, though, and thanks for, thank your wife for texting you saying we got the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Just a few rapid fire questions to round things up and um, easy questions. You ready? Sure. Android or Apple? Yeah, neither. Someone needs to come up with a third option. I'm Apple. I'm Apple, iPhone. Oh, I just found I, somebody did come up with an option. Uh, shoot. And it's a really good option, by the way, I'm told. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's, as a matter of fact, it's so interesting that you might know this because you're an IT guy. Let me, let me see if I can dig it up quickly. I, I want to uh, I want to bounce this off you and see if you've heard about it yet. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I want someone to have like a private phone where we can all just use Starlink and move on. Oh, it's called, what the hell? No, I sure. Yeah, are, you about, are you about to say something? This is some kind of joke you're about to share. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's called the most secure phone. I only came across it, so it's funny that it came up. I have no idea if it's real other than that the, the video looks really, really good. Uh, okay, so back to the rapid fire questions that are never very rapid. Do you have a very, uh, do you have a, a, a favorite song, a favorite band genre that you go to? Um, you know, this is going to be embarrassing. The first thing that came to, to mind was Bon Jovi's It's My Life. Yeah, sure. I don't know why that song just came to mind. <laughs> but uh, I don't know why, Bon. that's totally embarrassing to admit, but there you go. That's that's my... Uh, well, it plays it, it, well. It, it plays into, yeah. you know, your life, your terms. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's it. It works, I guess. Yeah, it works, it works. right? <laughs> How about movie? Favorite movie? Braveheart. Yeah, Scottish mother, that uh, freedom, the whole messaging works with what I believe. So, yeah, absolutely Braveheart. But I have watched Gladiator like a million times, So, uh, but Braveheart. Oh, cool. And is there a book that you had a real, was a, you know, one that you really stands out for you as meaningful in your life or one that you get gift or refer on a regular basis? It's probably going to be something that you've heard 
you know, too many times, but Think and Grow Rich blew my mind in my 20s. Uh, but How to Win Friends and Influence uh, People, Dale Carnegie, that book just, I think, ma major impact on my life on how to connect with people, how to speak, how to present myself, how, you know, how to hold conversations. Uh, yeah, that that book to me is uh, really, really valuable. And I say that I, I probably should reread it because I think the last time I read it was like 20 years ago. But at that point in my life, I might, you know, that was huge. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I expect you to say, uh, rich dad, poor dad. I think that's become a, that's a, it seems like a Bible for most real estate guys, but think and grow rich. I just want to share with you that, I mean, I've interviewed people from all over the world and that are very, very successful. And almost all of them have said, think and grow rich. And even to the extent where I've had some guests say, I read it every year religiously. Yeah. Wow. yeah. You know, yeah, I actually, um, yeah, I don't know if I want to admit this publicly, I guess I'm going to is that like, I, uh, yeah, for my, my, uh, you know, late teenage children, I would, I would pay them to read certain books. Yeah. I because as, as their father, I wanted certain information in their brain and I was going to get it in there. <laughs> smart i did this i did the same by the way did you okay sometimes when i share that i'm like i don't know what people are going to think of me uh, this, but <laughs> that's a brilliant strategy you know with my daughter it was uh i'll pay to read the book but uh, you know if you read the book i, I don't know what I, I think it was as much as 50 bucks depending on the book we played the game around it but ultimately but she had to report to me like she had to i had to same know here. That she yeah i needed it. a yeah. presentation yeah. back yeah yeah and you know i like a, a point each chapter, why they liked it or didn't like it. Yeah. So same kind of thing. Cause I, I thought that was my smart way to get them to have presentation skills. Yeah. You know? I, I had, <laughs> I had decent success with that strategy, but not always, you know, not no, always. no, not, no, oh, but you kids. were trying. Just trying. For, okay, good. I'm for, glad you did it too. Right. <laughs> your room, your desk or your car. What do you clean first? Room, uh, desk or a car. Uh, lately it's been my car. Yeah. Car. Are you a car guy by any chance? No, no, no. But I got this Tesla that I'm also embarrassed to admit I have uh, for some reason, and uh, I, I keep it pretty clean. Yeah, I'm not a car guy. I, and I think I'm just at a point in my life, you know, that I don't, I, I, I don't care. Hassle, yeah, I want less things. I want yeah, less I things. Do you know what my uh, most recent revelation is? I'll just share it quickly, is that number, well, I don't know if it's a revelation, but uh, for the longest time, I just don't want more stuff. I, it, I always joke, if I got to insure it, wash it, yeah. Do it like I don't want it, Same. and and the the other revelation I had it's not a regret but it's a realization that I wish I would have known that when I was forty. Yeah. And yeah. So I look I at it now and I go, huh. anyways, different different conversation. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say when you get to the gates? Oh, welcome. We've been expecting you. <laughs> beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. And Tom, final question. What are you grateful for? Oh, everything. Uh, relationships, networks, meeting people like you, the opportunity to experience what we're experiencing right now, all of it. Just grateful for life. Yeah, just all of it. The, everything. And, you know, I, I think of it. Yeah, all of it. I hear you. I am very grateful as well to have the opportunity to uh, have this conversation with you. Thanks for joining me on the show. Very, always very grateful for my wife, Stephanie, and uh, the world and the life we've created. Uh, with all its challenges, I'm grateful for my challenges. So, uh, Tom, thanks for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me, Patrick. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. If you found value in the podcast, please take the time to rate and review and share with others, share with your friends, as it is my goal to always improve and to provide the highest value for you, the listener. If you have any comments, suggestions, or questions you'd like answered, please email me at ceo at raincanada.com. That's ceo at reincanada.com. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, Patrick out.